title of my talk, not only was I, the, did the room switch where I was giving this talk, but the title is not listed correctly, it doesn't matter. The title of the talk is essentially stuff that I think about time um, based on research. Um, and why I think it is that that our conscious experience and our non-conscious experience are, are different. Um, but I do need the slides up. So I'm just going to tell you my experience coming here. Um, my experience coming here as a scientist is that before I come, I prepare my slides and I get all excited and I say, ooh, this will be really revolutionary, you know. I'm going to talk about how, how all these things that scientists are supposed to think about are the data actually suggests that things are different than that. And uh, I come here and I, I have come here twice now and I keep forgetting, oh, it's only been twice, so maybe you can forgive me, but I keep forgetting that the people who have gone through the meditative, contemplative, mystical path got to where I'm getting with science like thousands of years ago. <laughs> it's, so, it's so embarrassing. It's like, <laughs> it's like coming on stage and saying, like being a toddler and saying, look, mommy, it's a tree, you know? And the, and the audience is like, yes, it's a tree, you know, that's great. Um, so please indulge me. But I also have to say, I think that's what all this stuff is like when you public speak. It's always like, look, it's the obvious thing, and people say, oh, it's the obvious thing, thanks for reminding us. So hopefully it'll just be a reminder. So here, we can go, great. So what is time to the non-conscious mind? I guess that's the title of my talk, and how do past, present, and future unite behind the scenes? Um, I'm not gonna answer either of those questions because I can't answer either of those questions, but I'm gonna talk about uh, those questions. Um, I'm not sure what part of the world I need to click. There we go. So there's a language problem. Mm -hmm. You want me to say next? I'll say next, but don't count that next. Um, okay, so there's a language problem uh, that I'm become aware of whenever I come to this conference and whenever I talk to people in the contemplative traditions, which is a very different definition of consciousness, and I want to address that up front. So Christoph Koch, who is the chief scientific officer at the Allen Institute for Brain Science, and who's a well-known neuroscientist, maybe one of the best-known neuroscientists right now, says, by consciousness, I mean the ability to feel something, anything, whether it's the sensation of an azure blue sky, a toothache, being sad, or worrying about the deadline two weeks from now. So that's generally the view of what consciousness is to neuroscientists, okay? So it's like, um, next slide. So it's like this, imagine a city, it flies the flag of the brain, so this is the city of neuroscience, and it's, a, it's the top of a, a skyline, it's always covered in clouds. They never see below the tops of the buildings, everyone in that city lives at the tops of these buildings, they don't know what's going on underneath, okay? So their experience is, there's all these different buildings, and one could be Julia, and one could be Brooks, and one could be Mikey, there are different buildings. There's not much of a connection between them. And every once in a while, every once in a while, a door in the top of the building opens and someone steps out and just gives a message. So like, say I'm one of those buildings and I have the experience of someone stepping out of these doors. Well, they don't know it's an elevator because they're not aware that there's something underneath. There's just these doors. And someone steps out and says, um, Aunt Susie. And I say, oh, thank you, I couldn't remember the name of that person. And then the doors close, and we don't see them again. So to a neuroscientist, this is the city, and underneath those clouds is this vague thing we're going to call um, unconsciousness or non-conscious processing. Okay. So now, thank you. Now let's look at the mystical definition of consciousness. So we're going to have Deepak here who says, in my definition of consciousness, consciousness is the same thing as life. What wisdom traditions also call spirit. Consciousness conceives, governs, constructs, and becomes the activity of the body. So Rupert Spiro this morning was talking about consciousness like that. You can go to the next slide. This is a different city. This is, I know, seems like a different city, but it's actually the base of the city we were just talking about. So beneath the surface, this is where, I put the Tibetan flag up there, but any kind of mystical contemplative tradition lives. In this world, above the clouds, is what we, they call local consciousness, finite consciousness, some people call it unconsciousness, walking around unaware, and beneath the clouds is what we call non-local or infinite or cosmic consciousness. 
So I wanted to bring up that language difference because as a neuroscientist, when I talk about consciousness, it's, you need to ask me what I'm talking about because it might not be the same thing. And when you're a contemplative person and you're talking to a neuroscientist and they agree with you about something about consciousness, they could be talking about exactly the opposite thing. So it's important. Okay, so in my talk, when I talk about conscious awareness, I'm talking about everyday waking consciousness, what the mystics would call sort of um, illusion. Okay. Right, so we're going to go back to William James, who is one of the parents of neuroscience. One of, I always go back to him to get clarity on things. And when I was thinking about this issue, I said, let's go see what William James says. And what William James says in 1909 is, but the trees also commingle their roots in the darkness underground, and the islands also hang together through the ocean's bottom, just so there is a continuum of cosmic consciousness against which our individuality builds but accidental fences, and into which our several minds plunge as into a mother sea or reservoir. Okay, so this is my go-to guy for neuroscience. Well, he agrees with the mystics, okay? So from here on out, even though I'm gonna be talking like a neuroscientist and I'm gonna talk about non-conscious stuff, which some people would call cosmic consciousness, including William James, um, just know that I'm aware that even at the roots of neuroscience, we have the same conception, okay? Go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so the current understanding of time in research psychology or experimental psychology and neuroscience is like this. Um, so it's moving from left to right, linearly. Um, you have a duck in physical reality, or any object in physical reality. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Then you have non-conscious processes and they're living in your brain and they turn that duck into edges and shapes. Go ahead, next slide. Which reproduces the duck in your conscious awareness. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Non-conscious processes are seen as a helper app. In other words, the stuff that you need to get to, next slide, the point. The point is your conscious experience of what's out there. Okay, this is, this is the current understanding in research psychology and neuroscience. So go ahead, next slide. So um, this is not the current model of time, but this is the model that I'm gonna show you actually the evidence supports. So this is this not model, not current model, but my model, is that you have um, conscious awareness, physical reality, and non-conscious processes, just like the other model. But say you have this weird kind of alien creature in physical reality. Your non-conscious processes represents that. Next slide, please. And turns it into a duck-like thing. Okay, next slide, please. And then you have conscious awareness in which at, only at that moment do you have this thing called now, because that's the object that just came into conscious awareness. The reality is the everything that's not conscious awareness. Next slide. And the story is conscious awareness. Now you're gonna recognize this model from the mystical model. It's the same, same model. But I got to it not through mysticism, I got through it, to it through data. And what's fascinating to me is that we live in this universe where you can do science on objects that are actually part of your conscious experience, which is a story, and you can get information that tells you that in fact what you were looking at is a story. So it seems very generous that we can get to this truth in multiple ways. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, Donald Hoffman, you ought to see his talk tomorrow if, if you can because it's wonderful. he's wonderful. Um, he has this interface theory of perception and here's a great um, sort of illustration of a perceptual trick that is played all the time. It's the trick of motion, okay? So as you know, um, you can look at that and I can tell you that each one of those images is just a frame and when they go by quickly, your brain experiences it as motion. But I don't care how many times I tell you that, you still experience it as motion. You can't get out of that illusion, okay? And that happens all the time. It's happening with everyday motion, in fact. We have these discrete moments that we're then creating motion from. So this illusion is happening all the time and, and you could know everything about that illusion and you still experience it. You know, vision neuroscientists still go to movies, right? So um, the reason I bring that up is because, go ahead, next slide. Donald Hoffman has this great story. He's a, he, he works um, with computational um, 
biology and computational philosophy or computational neuroscience, whatever you want to call it. And he creates these creatures. He can tell you more tomorrow, but like a, I imagine like a smart bunny and a, and a simple bunny. And it turns out that if you take these creatures, the, the smart bunny is programmed, it's just a little programming tool. The smart bunny is programmed so that it represents everything that's in the external environment. The stupid bunny just represents one thing. And it's very difficult to, go ahead, next slide. It's very difficult to find an environment where the simple bunny does not win. The simple bunny does not replicate more, produce more babies, and basically beat out the smart bunny. So his point is, that's how we are. We do not go around representing everything that's out there in physical reality. We have an interface that offers us what is useful. And we represent only what is useful. And it may not be representative at all of what is out there. That's why I have in the model a weird alien creature that turns into a duck. We have no idea whether what we're experiencing relates to something out there or not. No idea. We will never know. OK, next slide, please. So some folks in, uh, some Dutch folks who's the first Dick Steer, who's someone who's Dutch can maybe pronounce that way better, and Nordgren, uh, Lauren Nordgren in 2006, they suggested this um, simple idea, unconscious thought theory, which is that um, your non-conscious processes, and again, most people here would include in that cosmic consciousness, seems to be able to process things in parallel. Its forte is complex decisions, and it has a very high capacity for information processing. Whereas your conscious awareness processes things serial, one at a time, serially, makes simple decisions, and has a low cap capacity for information processing. So which one is in charge? I don't get it, right? There's all, this, there's all this focus in the world of neuroscience of trying to understand consciousness. But it's the booby prize. It's the story. What are we even, why aren't we looking at this other? So anyway, OK, next slide, please. So uh, here's a neat experiment related to time with unconscious thought theory. So people in unconscious thought theory do these kind of experiments where you have to make a complex decision and you see what part of your mind makes the decision better, your conscious awareness or these non-conscious processes. So what they did is they gave a bunch of students um, two examples of phones. Um, the one on the left, they said, here are four features of the phones and they were all positive. The one on the right, they say, um, here are four, ooh, that's a misprint. The one on the right, they say four bad features. I apologize for the misprint. Then they give the folks a break. Just, you know, go hang out, come back. Then on the, the phone on the left is represented to them. They give them two good features, two bad features. The one on the right, same thing. Two good features, two bad features. And the question is, which phone would you like to buy? So go ahead, next slide. Conscious awareness, so the, basically when the students sat there for two minutes and deliberated about which phone would I like to buy, it thinks those two are equivalent because it only integrated information from after the break. It didn't think about any of the information before the break. Next slide. Non-conscious processing, which they accessed by distracting the students with a memory task, so they weren't even thinking about the problem. Those folks picked the correct phone. Next slide. That's actually the correct choice, was to integrate all the information, not just the most recent information, right? Again, who's in charge, right? So next slide, please. So we've just talked about the past and integrating information from the past. And it looks like non-conscious processing integrates information further back than conscious processing. Well, what's the story with the future? We have a story based on our conscious awareness that um, we can't know what's about to happen. Well, if that's a story, what's going on with our non-conscious processes? What's happening there? Um, so I have this hypothesis shared by many people, you've probably heard Dean Radin talk about this, that physiological systems are preparing themselves for important events via non-conscious or unconscious access. So the way I think about this is if you put your finger in um, rushing water from the tap, or you put a stick in a stream, you'll notice two things. The biggest wake is downstream of your finger or downstream of the stick. But there is a little bump in the water produced by back pressure from the object that actually produces almost a little bit of warning. There's something coming up, right? That's how I think about presentiment. That little bump is a warning in time. 
that something's coming up. It's not as big as this downstream wake, but it's present and you can see it, right? Next slide, please. So um, this is my favorite slide to show about this kind of effect, and I've shown it here, I actually showed it here last year. I'm a little embarrassed because I'm doing this really cool experiment that I would like to show you the results of, but because it's uh, based on an Android app and there were some programming pro problems, I don't have the data yet, so I'll show you last year's stuff. <laughs> what can I say? But it's cool data. Um, so what I did was, I had a group of people, students, they were like 18 and 19 year old college students, and I had them come into the lab and hook them up to skin conductance electrodes, and I tell them, look, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures, and there'll be four on each screen, and your job is to tell me which of those four um, you think is going to win for that trial. And you do it by pressing a mouse on the one you think is going to win. And they'd say, what do you mean is going to win? And I'd say, you know what, the computer's just randomly going to choose one, so just try to predict the future. Like, you know. And they say, all right, that's crazy. And I say, oh, it's crazy. And then um, they try to do it. Now, just so you know, their ability of doing this on average is at chance. So just like you and I generally in our conscious waking experience, we generally don't know what's about to happen. Like, who knew that I was going to jump up like that, right? Like, no one in the room. It's a, that's my favorite demonstration for two reasons. One, I get oxygen to my brain, but also um, no one predicted it. It is not our conscious experience that we can predict the future. And I just want you to know I'm very clear on that. And these students were very clear on that and their behavioral data were very clear on that. But what if we use the skin conductance measurements from these people as indicators of what was going on non-consciously? Well, we can do that. So as skin conductance increases, it suggests arousal. And when skin conductance goes down, it suggests you know, mellowness, I guess. Um, so, Let's look at what happened after participants were shown which picture, picture one, okay? So when they were shown the correct picture, that's the black line, and I've got two sets of participants. One set is female, one set is male. After I explain this to you, I'm gonna have you guess which is which. The black line and the areas around it are the standard error for the responses to, oh, you got it right. The 10 seconds after being shown that answer. The red is the responses to, are the responses to Oh, you got it wrong for the 10 seconds after they were shown the answer. You notice on the top, there's no difference, and on the bottom, there's a big difference. You should also note that the scale on the bottom is twice that, if you look at the y-axis, the scale is twice that as on the top. So knowing what you know about 18-year-old boys and 18-year-old girls, which graph is the men? Which group of people is more interested in being right? Let me, girls, you think? <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> you and I have had different experiences. Um, so the lower graph is the men, and the upper graph is, is the women. So um, let me show you now what's happening before. Okay, same people, what's happening before. Go ahead, switch to the next slide, before they know. So on the bottom, we have the men starting to get excited 10 seconds before. They're about to be shown whether they're correct or not, and not getting as excited when they're about to be shown as incorrect. For women, we see the reverse pattern. Women are actually mellowing out before they're being shown as correct. Men, I mean, and, um, and actually getting excited before it's incorrect, but that's not statistically significant at the top. It's borderline. The bottom is, and the gender difference is. I went ahead and ran myself actually 625 times on this, because <laughs> I wanted to know, was I more masculine or feminine in this way? And, um, you know, as a scientist, you kind of get androgynous in many ways. But I ended up more like the top. So I'm fascinated by this gender difference because um, a lot of my uh, colleagues will say, well, maybe you're just looking at noise. Well, if this gender difference persists, explain to me how noise falls into this parameter dependency. Right? I'm fascinated by that. So next slide, please. So I worked with um, Jessica at at University of California, Irvine, and Patrizio Trasoldi, who's at University of Padova in Italy, thank you, um, to create a meta-analysis of these kind of studies that actually look before an event happens. And trust me, in physiology, it's not a thing that you do. So you, these actually have to be studies that were developed for this purpose. And we went through all sorts of quality um, 
concerns, and actually I won't talk about that here because I've spoken about that in other talks, but there's a lot of problems that you need to account for when you're being rigorous about this stuff, and we went through all that. And I published this uh, meta-analysis in an online journal, and actually that number is around 57,000 viewers have looked at this. The reason I show this is not to show off, but to point out, well, I guess sort of probably have some motivation about showing off, but also, um, those aren't all scientists, right? So these are mostly, I mean, they're just not 57,000 scientists, really, who are going to read this. So people are interested in this stuff. So that really encouraged me. So I guess I'm sort of partly just telling my story. Am I feeling more encouraged? So go ahead, next slide. And these are the data um, that very strongly and highly statistically significantly support this presentiment hypothesis. So you can see on the, on the x-axis, we have a study effect size for each of 26 studies. So those are the circles that are not filled in. And on the y-axis, you have a measure of precision. And they make this nice funnel shape, with, which they should. And then you can use mathematics to calculate these six uh, filled in values, which are the values that we predict are there, but people haven't reported. And even with those filled in values, the study effect size is highly significant. And if you're into statistics, you can see that on the bottom half of that slide. Um, next slide, please. So it looks to me that non-conscious processing accesses the deep past, the present, and the future. In another way of saying that is that non-conscious processing creates the past, present, and the future. Next, please. So what else is like this? What else do we know creates the past, present, and future when, in fact, they all exist at the same time? Physical reality is like this. So what we know about physical reality from from special relativity and quantum electrodynamics or quantum field theory is that past, present, and future are there. They all exist at once, right? So again, go back to the division that neuroscientists make between conscious awareness and non-conscious processing. Which one is more reflective of what we, even as neuroscientists, think is important, which is physical reality? It's non-conscious processing. So what's going on as we go through and try to understand this whole system that we call the mind, is that even neuroscientists, if you look at the data, need to come to the conclusion, next slide, that conscious awareness is the story and unrepresentative of, of like what's actually going on. And everything else, next slide. Every, oh, sorry, I took that one slide up. Everything else is um, the stuff that's happening. And so you can call that soup or you can call it cosmic consciousness, you can call it whatever you want, but it's different from the story. Right? So I just want to thank my um, colleagues and also the folks at Northwestern who are my lab hosts, Marcia Grabowiecki, Satoru Suzuki, Ken Paller, some folks at Google I've been talking with, my funding sources, and um, I just want to point out, even though it looks like I've got it made in terms of funding sources and hosting, I'm on soft money, I'm looking for a job, so if you feel like hiring me, <laughs> I will work for you. <laughs> <laughs>